groups of seven. And um, this is being recorded, got it. Okay, so Steve is a line of scrimmage official on the, uh, in the Mountain West Conference. Um, and then uh, Stabil uh, from the PAC-12 is also with us. Uh, the two of them are gonna share their tips, experiences, what's important to them. Um, there are gonna be differences. I'm gonna tell you that up front. When that happens, Scott or myself will come in and say how it's different or not. Uh, Steve and John may ask us what we do. We'll chime in and clarify. But um, we're also going to be um, monitoring the chat room. Scott and I will uh, interrupt with questions from the chat room. And other than that, we're going to go a strong hour and be up to 85 participants. So um, on behalf of the San Diego County Football Officials Association, Steve Hoslett and John Stabil, thank you so much for being here. And go. <laughs> you're welcome. Well, John, you're up. Well, I'll go first since I showed up first. About that. <laughs> <laughs> um, gentlemen uh, and any ladies that are in the room, uh, uh, thanks so much for having, having me, Steve. Thanks for your brightness. Um, I don't have much much to say other than what we were going to go over as the topics that were presented by Steve to um, Steve and I to go over. Um, what I want to make clear is we do have film here uh, for a couple of the topics. We don't have film for all the topics because some of them are kind of talking points. Um, I encourage everybody to participate and ask questions as you as you feel um, that you want to jump in. I know we, we had a chat room, but you know, if you got to come off the mic or something like that and, and uh, off mute and jump in and you know give us give us some stuff, especially correct us because, I'll be perfectly honest with you. There's some things in here that I had questions about what the rulings in high school. Um, so I want to make sure we're not giving you guys um, any kind of bad advice here. So um, one of the first things that uh, Steve mentioned here was he wanted to go over um, coaches communications, how we communicate with coaches. Um, I think it's something I covered. I presented this a couple of years ago. Um, you know, Coach communication, I've always been on the, under the understanding that it starts as soon as you walk on the field. Um, you know, basically the way you comport yourself, the way um, your uniform fits, your the confidence with you, which you walk, um, you know, and frankly, it's something I've struggled with my whole career. It's something I try to build on every year. So, you know, the time when I show up, I always try to get to those guys as soon as I can. I don't try to interrupt their drills, but our communication with the coach starts an hour before the game or um, however early we're supposed to be at the games um, where I can find a, a time where I can get to that guy and say, hey, look, look him square in the eye, take my hat off, shake his hand, let him know I'm here to help him all day long. Um, and, uh, you know, just, just have that good, good rapport to start the game. No matter, no matter if I had a bad experience with a coach or not. As a matter of fact, if I had a bad experience with a previous coach, he's the guy I'm going to focus on the most. Just to get to him and say, "Look, whatever happened the last game, I don't, I won't bring up last game, but I just want whatever I'm saying to him, let him know that I'm, I've moved on. This is, this is a new game." So, John, we're gonna uh, this year. We're asking both flank officials to go together and introduce themselves um, to both head coaches. So if you and I are a team, um, I'll go with you to your coach and you're gonna introduce me and explain to him that we were, how we work together, communicate questions, get, get information that he needs, blah, blah, blah. Then when you come over to my sideline, I introduce you to my coach. Okay. That sound. Do you guys? I, I you agree guys, with you, Steve. That's really important before the game because it sets a whole tone that the coaches know you'll communicate with them. And I specifically say, hey, if there's any concerns, any questions, whatever you have, please send it over to you and we'll get the answer to you as quickly as possible. It might take a, a little bit of time to get an answer, but we'll get it to you. Right. So. 
Um, do you guys switch at halftime sidelines? No, we don't do that unless it's an emergency of some sort. Okay. Nope, that's fine. And that's very important. I think it's a great, I think it's a great thing. We we have been switching sidelines for the past 10 years or whatever. So yeah, we're naturally um working with both fish, both coaches. Uh, I, I think it's a great, a great practice to have to meet the other coach and let them know, hey, you look them square in the eye and say, hey, um, whatever information you get, my guy will talk to me. We'll get it to you as soon as we can. Um you know, John, real quick before you go on. One of the things that I've learned over the years is I spend a lot of time building a very, very, very good relationship with a coach on the sideline and making it very professional. It, other than the referee, I don't really want my umpire or my back judge or anyone else coming over and talking to my coach during the game, yelling at him about something that's going on. If they have any questions or any issues or any problems with my sideline, they need to come to me. And in hindsight, if the coach wants to talk to one of them, I'll find out and say, hey, coach, what do you got? And he says, I want to ask the back judge about, about why he called good catch interference on a punt. And so I'll, and I say, coach, OK, I'll go get him on the break. And then I give him a heads up as he's running over so he knows exactly what we're going to talk about before. But if you can keep the other officials from coming over, other than the referee, because he gets free reign, uh, it helps out a lot. Yep. Uh, I take great pride in nobody having to show up on my sideline, especially the referee. Um, I haven't, I frankly haven't had a referee kind of have to come to the sideline to correct anything um, with a coach as far as communication goes. You know, and I, I, uh, Don Clay, I was Don Clay's other uh, partner last year, and Don's on this uh, call. He he reminds wow. he reminded us that um, we we have tell the coach that it, we have all two O's, so we're able to communicate across the field and get that information right away. Um, so the other thing too is when you bring a referee over, the other coach wants to talk to him too. So now we're slowing the game down. Yeah. So you know, it's, <laughs> as much as you can, try to prevent the referee having to come. Out. What was that? <laughs> uh, we've got guys that are not muted. Hey, Scott, Ed, can you, you mute your uh, thing, Ed? Ed Canner, can you mute, please? Scott, I I think you can uh, mute participants. Yeah, I've been going through and muting them as they as they pop in or as they start to say something. So <clears> I'm <throat> trying to stay on top of that. If I mute all, then everybody does. So I'm trying to do it individually. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Hey, John, yeah. you're going to spend a minute talking about how you deal with coaches in sticky situations when they're fired up? Um, that was sort of what I had here. Um, so obviously not every game goes swimmingly. Um, you know, there's going to be things that happen. The coach is going to get fired up. Different coaches are, you know, will behave a lot differently. Um, some are more fiery than others. Um, some are just, you are, you make it hard for us to communicate with. Um, you know, when those situations arise, the one thing I try to do is try not to yell over him or yell or raise my voice because the more I try to talk at a level tone, the more they, they have a tendency to start quieting down so they can hear what the hell I say. My voice does not carry naturally anyway. So they have a hard time hearing me anyway. So a lot of times that benefits me because they start to quiet down a bit. But the one thing I don't do is ignore them. You know, no matter how hard a coach is, no matter how ridiculous the things he's bringing up, I don't ignore them, but, I will try to give him every bit of information that I have. I'll give him more information he needs. So you set that tone, like, you know what, you can go nuts on me. I'm not gonna, I'm not, don't, I'm not gonna let him take me, take me out of my attention to my job that I'm doing, but he's not gonna chase me away. So if I have a piece of information, whatever it might be, I will run right to him and tell him, hey, look, this is what you got. And if he wants to continue to yap, I can walk away from it and he can choose to follow me, but they typically don't. So never get yourself in a situation where you feel like you're having to shy away from a coach, you know, um, take it upon yourself to like, hey, you know what? I know he's probably gonna say something I'm not gonna like, but I'm gonna give him information. If he takes good things that I'm telling him and wants to come back with something crazy, that's on him, you know, so. And one other little tidbit on that, what I've learned over the years, when you get a coach, 
who's a constant complainer. And I'm and now we're just talking about head coaches, by the way. When you get a head coach who's a constant complainer, what I've learned is if he says, hey, that's a hold, and you, of course, see it, and you turn around and say, coach, no, it's not big enough. If you answer his questions about five times, he'll stop complaining. So when he complains about something, say, no, coach, not today or not this, and just give him a simple professional answer, though most of the time they'll stop complaining about all the little stuff because they know they're not going to, it's not going to change anything. So, and the only other thing with regards to coaches is, and I think John and I both agree with this, head coach gets a lot more lead away than assistant coaches. Assistant coaches can come over and they can ask a question. I have no problem with it, but we're not going to sit and listen to an assistant coach bitch and complain about plays and whether we missed a hold and all that. And the easiest way to handle it is you simply walk up to the head coach in a nice calm voice and say, and I always point at him and I say, this assistant over here is about ready to cost you 15 yards coach. Do you want to take care of it? Do you want me to? And 99% of the time they'll take care of it. And you won't hear another word from the assistant in that situation. And we don't want to flag a bench. We want to flag coaches. I mean, you know, let's face it. Assistant coaches will be someday head coaches, some of them. So, you know, this is a relationship, you know, business, you know, you're developing a relationship with that coach. We can take the time to develop a relationship with the, with the assistants to a point. So, you know, we can communicate with them, but they're going to have to be, they're held to a different uh, <clears throat> level of, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Respect. Behavior. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, let's face it, your head coaches, a lot of times they just want to vent. So, so we're done. John, what's the next one you want to go on? I think we beat that one up. Yep. Um, you're up. You got the crew communication. Okay. So crew communication, and, and we work with the same people each week, so we've got a little bit of an advantage because we've got a comfort level. A lot of times you guys don't. When I show up to a game and I'm working with new people, there's only a handful of things that I want to cover in the pregame with my other line of scrimmage guy, with my umpire, et cetera. So in the pregame, you should have five, six, seven things. It doesn't have to be big and it doesn't have to be exhaustive. But if you're talking to your line of scrimmage guy and you haven't worked with them, always talk about cross field mechanics. We always talk about getting spots. If you got a good, and I always say, hey, if you have a good look at a spot on my side, like a guy's running up to score and he's diving in the end zone at the hash mark on my side, and I'm blocked out. That means the guy on the other side has a good look at it. I tell him, I go, if you got a good look at it, step up. Because if you don't step up in a situation like that, what that does for me is if I'm blocked out, I eventually got to make a call and I'm going to have to guess. So I talk to him about crossfield mechanics and I tell him on crossfield mechanics that the farther I come on the field, the better my spot is. If I'm standing on my sideline, I got a spot for you, but it's not great. If I'm crashing and I'm at the numbers, the hash mark, and even farther, that means I have a phenomenal spot, and you better have a good reason not to take it. So the farther I come on the field, the better my spot is with that. The only other thing I talk to, like with an umpire, I'll always ask him, I go, hey, if we have a, a quarterback sneak up the middle and the ball's laying in the end zone, what are you going to do? What are you going to give me? And all I really want from him simply is, I want you to tell me, hey, the ball's sitting in the end zone. And he's controlling the ball in the end zone. Because we had a play one time where the guy scored, the ball got lost. After he scored, it's bouncing around, and nobody ever called, called whether it was a touchdown or not. We had no idea. So I just simply want him to help me in those situations. So whatever you do, talk to the umpire, find out what he's going to do for there. And I also tell him, especially just what's he going to do on a, on a slant pattern where the, court, where the receiver is going down to the ground and whether it skips off the ground or not. Because a lot of times he's got the best look and hopefully he'll step up in that situation and help us on there. So just go through a few things crew wise before the game, just to make sure you're on the same page to kind of avoid a couple of things. Obviously there's a couple of things you want to ask your referee. If you're working with new referees about how they want fouls recorded or, or reported and all that type of stuff. So, so before the game, that's it. During the game, I'm a big fan of, we don't sugarcoat things on the football field. If I, if John throws a flag and, and I, and I, for a pass interference and I see it and I don't like it, I'm going to walk up to John and I'm going to say, Hey, John, first thing I say is John, what do you got? And if he says, Hey, I got a holding on the defense. I'm going to say, fine, I'm out of there. And I leave. If he says I got pass interference, I go, okay, what did he do? And he'll say, Hey, he got there early. And if I know he didn't get there early, I'll say, Hey, John, 
I got him getting there, bang, bang. At the same time, I don't think it's a foul. And I always end it with, and I'm willing to take you off it if you want to pick it up. So there's no doubt in the whole conversation about what to do on there. And the other thing what I've learned over the years is, especially with younger officials, is when the big plays happen like this, they'll come in a million miles an hour. They're all fired up and they're screaming and yelling. And, and, and what I've learned is you got to just calm down and have a conversation that's nice and calm. Pretty much in the voice for having rights, like, John, what do you got? I got this. Boom. And you just talk about it. So nice and calm. But the mo most important thing is don't try and sugarcoat it. Don't have a key in there and go, hey, did you get a good look at that? Or whatever those codes are that we used to use a while ago. Just be straightforward with it. And if there's any question about any play that you feel is wrong, shut it down. Come in and ask the question. I'm a big fan. I tell my referees every year, I'm going to come in and ask you four or five questions. They're going to be wrong. You're going to get pissed at me. But the fifth one's going to be right, and you're going to thank me. And so I'll keep coming in like that. So whatever you do, make sure you ask the questions on the field. If something just doesn't seem right, shut it down and talk about it on there. Um, but other than that, on communication, that's all I got, John, unless you got something you want to add. Um, no, I mean, just other than, you know, I know our, we, we work with, with our deep partners. You know, if we got a long run or a long pass and, part, and our partner has a spot, you know, Tom say, look, if you got a spot and I'm 30 yards away from it, either take it or tell me what it is. <clears throat> you know, um, you know, obviously we want to be good at be able to get those spots from 30 yards away. But if you got somebody there five yards away and they know what it is, you know, I'll take Especially it. The, I think the, the back judge is the one that's going to help you guys out because you only have five. You work five man mechanics. So the back judge, it's all right for that guy for him to get a spot, for the back judge to get you a spot, you know, so. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about um, um, whether you prefer on those important conversations to be speaking face to face, you know, verbally or over the O2O? I, I'm 100 percent. It's going to be a face to face. I had a play last year at the end of the last game of the season, and I thought I brought the ball back and moved it back two yards. And I thought the ball was fumbled out of bounds, but it wasn't fumbled out of bounds. It was just a brain fart. And I had three people asking me questions over the O2O. And then I had a deep guy that ran like five yards from me and stopped. And we never got it right. So I'm a big fan of the O2O will muddy things up in a sticky situation. If it really, really matters and you're going to do something that's uh, unusual, and it's probably only three, four, maybe five plays a game at most, you need to look somebody in the eye and have the communication talk. That's my thought on it, at least. Yeah, I think if you're yeah. going to take somebody off a call, you know, and you're so far away, you got to use the O2O. Chances are you're too far away to take them off the call. You know, and that's, you know, just make the effort to run and cut them off and, and you know, have that face-to-face. -face. And if you're going to do it, it looks better because, and don't make an official ever come to you. You got to go to him because if he has to come to you to ask you a question, now his call looks like it's in doubt. And if you do it over the O2O and have him pick up a flag, now it's really going to look like it's in doubt because it looks like he threw it and then picked it up himself rather than having to talk with somebody. So optics are really, really important, I think. Yep. And I'll be honest with you, O2O, a lot of times I'm hearing people on it. I'm, I mean, I've been working with the same crew for it's my third year going. There are times people are talking. I'm not exactly sure who is doing the talking. <laughs> so it is a good tool, the O2O, but in this case, when we're talking about you know, really trying to influence our partners face to face is definitely. It seems helpful. like it seems like radios work very well for us to make corrections. Um, you help with the umpire referee helping us with alignments, warning players, informing coaches, answering coaches questions. O2O is great for all of that stuff. But all this important stuff that you guys are just talking about. Forget it. You know, it's all it, uh, it's yeah. We we officiate for decades without without O two O's. I think we're, you know, sometimes you just have to go back and you know, start inventing fire again. So Justin Joseph, you have a question. Um, yeah, I was just gonna make a a, a comment. I thought uh, one of the important conversations I always have um, when I'm working with new folks, and even sometimes when I'm not, is 
uh, penalty enforcement process, um, specifically with the umpire, but also as a crew, making sure that before the umpire leaves, you know, the crew knows where we're starting from and ideally where we're going to as well. But I've had way too many penalty enforcement screwed up because an umpire just picked up and went without anybody communicating with him. That's right. So, so good transition to the next topic, by the way, Justin. Um, so what, what I've learned over the years with penalty enforcements, 95 to 98% of the time, if we misenforce a penalty, it's not because we walked off 11 yards or nine yards for a 10 yard foul. It's because we started on the wrong yard line. And so what we do, and we're re- and, and I'm very strict about it. I will not let my umpire or we actually have the center judge. I won't let the center judge or the umpire mark anything off until we make eye contact. And I and he usually signals one, two, or three or half the distance with the thing. And we agree on the starting spot. Because if you get if that and we do it every single time. And we'll, my, it's it's a given that they'll eventually do it. They'll say, hey, we, you guys weren't there, and I just went. I said, don't ever do it, because if you lead by yourself, we'll eventually get it wrong in the wrong part of a game. If you do those things, that simple thing takes an extra probably two or three or four seconds to get somebody lined up. You agree on where you're starting, and then walk it off, and then you agree on where you're putting it down. The chances of you misenforcing a foul are almost slim to none. And it doesn't have to be the headlines necessarily walking off with the umpire if the headlines is involved with the foul. It could be the line judge walking off with them and agreeing with them on there. But if you don't have it and the umpire just keeps going, you will eventually have a situation where he goes down there. Now he's on a yard line that is at 12 yards and it should be at 10 because he started off. And now you got to go fix it. And a lot of times it's hard to fix. And that's when you get in a lot of trouble. And it looks horrible when you go back and you start marking something off again. You just lose a little bit of credibility with the coaches. And it's the same with the chains. You got to make sure your chain, I don't think we have that on our list here, so I'm just going to briefly hit it. The chains, the chains is another thing. You got to make sure that they're 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 following the right procedures all the time. Because if they start moving when you don't tell them to move and then you try and reset them back up. Unless you have all the checks and balances like we have in our game, which I know a lot of people don't, it's hard to get them set back up in the right spot. You end up off five or 10 yards and it turns out to be a disaster in that situation. So. One of the things I want to add to um, our penalty enforcement is I've always tried to get our umpires and center judges, you know, obviously wait for us, but I don't want you to put the ball down until we can confirm the down. What's the next down? You know, give me two. All right, now we're putting the ball down. Um, there's just too many. Uh, there's too many times we put the ball down and we're going, and, so, and not everybody is on the same page with the downs. So, if that's something you know you can coordinate with your umpires or whoever's marking uh, marching off penalties, it definitely it just gives you confidence of you know we've got the right yard line, we've got the right down. Um, hopefully somebody's got the clock right. We do, we do. Hey, Scott, you had something about communication before we move on. Yeah, when we're talking, I mean, it's a great idea. Anytime you have a conversation and not a quick status, right, we're face-to-face. I would also just add, be mindful of your body language, right? Mm -hmm. Don't be demonstrative with your hands. Don't point to players. Don't point direction. You know, keep your hands controlled. Talk to your fellow official, and when you agree, you know, a simple nod is great. Uh, but we just want to be careful because when we get together as officials, that's where the entire stadium and everybody focuses on that point, right? Now, once right. we get done and we give it to the white hat and the white hat to make an announcement, the focus goes there. But when we're together, just be careful that we're not too demonstrative with our with our body language, with our hand signals, with our facial expression. The people are paying attention. Absolutely. Fair? Good point. It's a, it's a touchy thing. I mean, it, you know, you know, you're, you're going to try to talk somebody out of a foul, like everybody, in, like a flag's down, everybody's assuming there's a foul coming, you know? So now, you know, it's not even, not just the players, it's the coaches, it's the fans. Now all of a sudden we're, you know, trying to change directions on them. You know, yeah, we don't want to create any kind of uneasiness or, anything that would cause them to lose confidence in what we're doing out there. So very good point, Scott. 
Uh, hey, John, why don't you run with a player too? Right. Yep. So the next thing I got here is spots, um, which Steve already briefly touched on. Um, <clears throat> one, just a couple of notes I have here. I officiate every play to get every spot. Um, I don't know if I told you guys last time I uh, talked to you guys, but I officiate like there's no other guy. I'm, I'm the only linesman out there. Um, and I don't mean that that my guy's not going to get spots. I just assume every play that he's not going to be there for whatever reason, something he might have got hung up. Um, even if the play goes out of bounds on the other sideline, just having an awareness of where he went out. So, you know, if he does have to look at you, you got something. So um, just always fight for vision across the field or anywhere to make sure we're getting the spots. Um, and I look for a body part down before I look for the ball. I know a lot of us, you know, we, we're so focused on making sure somebody's got possession of the ball, make sure we're not blowing whistles unnecessarily. But, you know, people going into the goal line, you know, we're on, we're on the pylons. We're heading, you know, what are we looking at there? So we got a guy coming in. You know, I think our instinct is to look at ball, but really should be looking at ball body part and then ball. Um, sliding quarterback. I have a I have a play here. Does um do you guys is yeah, you gotta maximize it with the little corner box. Oh, I will, I will. What I'm okay. saying is um the uh sliding quarterbacks in high school, are they down when they when they break down? They are not down until they're down. A body part is down. Now they're defenseless. They could be fouled. It could be a personal foul. Okay. But we don't have the rule that um, that they are spot. Okay. okay. Uh, all right. All right. Too bad. I had a couple of plays for that. <laughs> um, so you we know, can use we can use your plays, John, to yeah. find out in high school where would he be down. Right. That's fine. All right, this play. So we got a headlinesman at the bottom. Um, what's what's your mechanic for going to the goal line? Are we five and in, seven and in? Um, it it we go all the way to the ten. If you're threatened and the because there's five men, if you're threatened, it's coming to you, and you you feel you need to get to the goal line. You have permission to go to the goal line now. Okay. So my recommendation, if you're going to start, with, if you're going to start at the ten for the goal line, uh, my recommendation is if there's a first down. At the seven yard line, you don't just go straight to the goal line. You go to the first down marker. And then if they get the first down, you know they're going to get the first down. Then you keep cheating to the goal line. But if there's a first down somewhere between where you're at and where the goal line is, make sure you're cognizant of where that is so that you can uh, get it. Because if, if there's a tight spot there, you got to get that spot. And we also have a um, cross field mechanic um, in that situation as well, Steve. So Perfect. you got to you got to fail safe across the field. Okay, very cool. A good point, Steve. All right, this one. Um, oh. This is a really, really tough play. Um, so did he get in? This right here is why you want to be on the goal line in this situation. Yep. If you can get there. Our guy got there. Oops. What happened? We're going to try something, uh, John. Let's go ahead and do this. But after between plays, we're going to optimize the screen. Oh, okay. It's it's a little jumpy. I'm trying to get that shot back. There's actually a shot that goes right down the goal line. There it is. Very tough. You know, we're fighting our way through, looking through bodies. Yeah. You know, old referee told me touchdowns are forever. Only ring them up if you know it's 100% touchdown. So this is a good example of when I was talking about earlier about the guy at the top of the screen might have a better view than the guy at the bottom of the screen. True. In this situation. I mean, there's not – the guy at the bottom is going to see it because there's nobody in that little gap right there. But if there's one more player in there, he might not see the ball. And so if you're at the top of the screen and you clearly see it breaks the plane, have the guts to come flying in and signal it. Yep. This is just so tight. 
Um, you know, frankly, I'm surprised replay didn't overturn us, but in any case, we talked about body language and selling calls and things like that. Watch our guy come in here. You know what? I got him short. So let me let me pause this for a second. So if you're at the top of the screen and you see this and you're hundred percent that he got in, what are we gonna do? If you see your bottom, the guy at the bottom of the screen coming in, and he's putting he's putting him short, but you're at the top and you're a hundred percent that he got in. What are we going to do in that situation? Coover, what would you want them to do? Well, you know, I want them to come in hard and and if they're if they're convinced it's a touchdown, then they're going to signal touchdown. So, and then they're going to have to discuss. So, yep. but it's Whenever going to have you get to... a situation where you have two signals that contradict each other, you have to come together and talk about it. Whether it's a catch yeah. incomplete, where one guy incompletes it, but the other guy goes through catch. So in this situation, if John and I had this and I was at the top of the screen, I'd come flying in signaling touchdown, even if he's already put him short. Because uh, this clearly there's not a knee down. It just has to do with whether the ball broke the plane. Then I'd go right to John and i say, hey, John, ball broke the plane. And he'd go, okay. And then what I tell him is, and this is, what I, this is the conversation I have with officials before I go, if we ever have contradictory signals, we are now both going to step back and signal touchdown rather than one guy signaling touchdown and the other one walking away uh, and like shaking his head for body language. Right. We're going to come together. We're going to agree on the call and we're both going to make the signal and boom. Because if you have contradictory signals, you got to come in and then I think you should have a conversation and then do another signal to confirm it. That's my thought at least. Okay. So we had a, sim a situation similar to this in a CIF championship game where the back judge immediately signaled him out the back of the end zone. The uh, deep flank um, saw a foot down. And he, instead of signaling touchdown, he went right over because they were so close to each other. He was able to go directly over to him and have that conversation. Then, just as you said, Steve, both of them stepped back and they both signaled touchdown. But when you're coming across the field, you can't wait all that time coming across the field to have that conversation, I think. Because you, you, you got the clock running. Everything's yeah, happening. Yeah. You've got a signal touchdown, and then, you know, be, but you, you better be sure. So I think, one of the I, things you, you as, a, as officials, our job is very, very simple. Our job is to get it right. I don't care if we look like crap on the play and one guy signals and one doesn't. At the end of the day, when you watch games on TV and one official screws it up and then they come together and talk about it and get it right, the announcers love it more than anything in the world. All they care about is getting the play right. And so at the end of the day, that should be the goal. And so never back down if you're 100% sure that something's being called wrong. All right. You got another one for us, John? Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, so what we're going to do, John, can you go out all the way out, stop sharing? Okay. Now go back up and when you first click on share, there's gonna be a little box. Optimize for video. Yep, I see. And that one you wanna optimize your video. It doesn't matter about optimizing the sound. All right, let's see if this works any better. Thank you. All right, so this one, is it looking any better? I think it is, John. Okay. This is, this is, these are tough plays, you know, we're, we're on the sideline. We have to, you know, we take in consideration where a guy's holding the ball, you know, which, which hand is this guy holding the ball in? You know, he's got the down, he's got the, we'll downfield arm not the upfield arm <clears throat> so this is a great spot by by our head linesman here um I can run it back john just before you do that just real quick everybody uh that's on this if you are not i can say a different way please stop your video there's no reason for us to have your video on right now and it's contending with bandwidth so that helped the, the playback as well so please stop your video if you have it on right now so there's two things that are that are 
important here. One thing I do know is that a lot of places I get to work, we have auxiliary boxes. Well, guess what? That's not always there, or auxiliary line to gains. So, you know, knowing where this line to gain is before this play happens is paramount. You know, knowing we have to get to the 14. So, but also knowing, being able to piece together, okay, we're going to the 14, and did this guy get a first down? I think he obviously he does. Um, and then spotting the ball. Um, you know, we're probably at the 13 and a half. <clears throat> um, you know, I think we always try to put it on a, on a, on a hard line. Kind of tough to do a lot of times. So we're trying to get away from that, John. Uh, we find a, uh, we can do a better job, like you said, of every down being accurate with our spots when we truly put it where the ball is. So um, I would encourage our officials to do it just as you said, right there at that half yard line. Yeah. And then the umpires have to be taught not to put it on the line because they have been doing it for a decade now, putting it on a hard line. And now we got to break them of that habit and get them to put the ball where it is where it is. That's it. And I agree with you 100%, Steve. One of the one of the things that I kind of I'm an offensive guy. I, I played. I was a wide receiver uh, when I was younger, and so I'm an offensive guy. What I've learned over the years is, if there's any question on whether something at the side is a catch or not a catch at the sideline, if there's any question about whether a, the ball is in or out of the end zone, or there's any question on whether a guy gets a first down or not, give it to him. And you'll be right almost every single time. If you don't, if you can't determine whether a, Cap pass is incomplete or not at the sideline because it's so quick and so tight. Give it to them. You'll be yeah. right almost every single time. Agreed. <laughs> Always go with the athlete. These kids can make a lot of great plays. Well, this was the running quarterback I was talking about, but yes, this will be a good discussion here about where he should be down. Look at a couple more clicks, John. Play it, play it all the way through fast forward without this, pausing it. This video is very smooth now, John. Okay. Very clear, very clean. So in college, you're going to be back at what, the 46 there? Yeah. So in high school, he's protected at the 46 because he's now defenseless. He's given himself up as if he's going out of bounds. But he doesn't strike the ground until he gets to what, 49, 48 and a half, where right. the ball was. So we're going to put the ball up there. If somebody went to tee off on him while he was in the act of giving himself up and sliding and they hit him with the crown of the helmet, then we're going to go with those fouls for sure. The one, one of the things you got to realize in plays like this, whether you're going to put it where he breaks down like we do or we're going to put it where he slides, he bounces his butt on the 48-yard line. The yeah. ball probably shouldn't be much more beyond the 48-yard line. Yeah. It, and then he bounces forward, and by the time your brain processes it, it looks like it's at the 49. Well, if, the four, if this is a fourth down play and the 49 is the first down marker, he's short. And so we need to be good enough to make him short. So I got a shin down here, so. Yeah. So just be really cognizant when you see these guys. You don't give them the – when they bounce, make sure you put it back a, a little bit. You know, these, these plays are tough. Um, you know, I, since, you know, I'm tuned now to get it where he breaks down. Even if I did this, I probably would have put him on the 48 um, if I was to do a body part. And, you know, watch his, this. I don't think his shin's down yet. Go forward one. Yeah. There he is. So the 48 would be a good spot in this situation. I think 48 is a good spot for this. The ball's down by his hip, right? It's up by his shoulder. Yeah. Up by his shoulder. Oh, oh yeah, left hand. It's in his left hand. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, it's tough. Um, you know, if you go back and watch, you know, you get these plays and you have an opportunity to get to, get to your film and watch to see how accurate you are with these are tough. And yeah. I've learned that I've always been a yard off. I've always given them a yard more than 
I should. So mm -hmm. nowadays I just go, anytime I get a spot, I'm like, step back one yard. And I've been on every time I do that. Even though in my mind, I think, damn it, it's surely what, it had to be to 47. And it was 46. <laughs> <laughs> so. John, you got the forward backward pass one? Yes, I do. What's this one? Okay, so our, let's look at pre-snap routine, Hoslet. What it what what do you, when you see a formation like this? What are you thinking if you're down at the bottom? So we're, we're a little bit different than you guys. Uh, why don't I ask somebody like uh, Scott? You want to give us who's the back judge taking in this situation? Well, in ours, the back judge still has tight end, but they're going to have the inside. Our flank official is going to have the outside. The one that's up is kind of split. That's where our, that's where our challenge is right now is the up receiver on this. So, uh, so if, I, if I'm on the bottom of the screen mm -hmm. and I know the back judge is going to take the inside uh, guy, I'm going to take the bottom two guys. Right. I mean, there's no reason why we can't watch two guys, especially in this situation. And then I'm going to watch the play develop as it, as it goes along uh, and see which guy's going to be the one that's going to kind of have the brick in his hand or the one that's going to cause me the, the issues. The other thing I'll do, see how the wide receivers all the way up on the line of scrimmage? When they do that, what happens is that guy will block your view of the tackle and the guard. What you need to do in a situation like this is adjust and either move a little bit downfield, a little bit in the backfield. But if you don't see all the players on your side of the center, you will eventually miss a false start. I missed a huge one on a slot one time that took a step and a half. And then, of course, they scored a touchdown or something big on it. But he took a step and a half just simply because – he was blocked out by the wide receiver. So adjust your body to make sure you see all the guys in the formation and you and you can uh, then see if they flinch or not flinch. Okay, so we're at third and 13. We've got a bunch down towards my side, down at the bottom. And so I'm thinking, and look at, look at how soft the defense is. So seven is not in a press. He's not bump and run. He's just down there to, to protect against the quick screen. 22 is over the top. Here comes the safety. He's moving over the top. So they're either going to run layered routes out here to try. It's third and 13. So they're going to either run layered routes or they're going to bubble screen behind this thing. So, you know, that's what I'm thinking. Go ahead and play, John. What, so what I'm looking at here is defensively, they've made this easy for me. There's no, there's no immediate threat for foul by defense except for maybe number three you know, depending on where he lines up. <clears throat> so as seven's not head up on, on the first guy, but if seven's head up on our, our number or number two receiver, my eyes are right here, but he's not doing anything. No, they're playing and, soft. And real quick, looking at the guy who's in the, on the pause it real quick. The guy who's all lined up on the purple line, the wide receiver, we don't ever want to Nick pick fouls. So if there's a coach standing behind you saying he's lined up in the neutral zone, if it's an offensive guy or a defensive guy spread out like that, that's lined up in that situation, we just don't want to create fouls, especially in a situation like this. Steve, what's, what's, what's your what's answer to the coach when he, tell, when he tells you that? I, I, well, if, if, if it, I actually go the opposite. If a coach comes over and tries to beg for a foul, I'm never going to give it to him. And I just simply look at the coach and said, coach, it's not big enough. And we're going to call it like this all day long. And then eventually there'll be another guy on their team that'll do the same thing. It's it's inevitable. They will. There's no doubt. But so but it, we don't it, want to interject ourselves in things like that where that is that tight. And and it's important that we minimize uh, the interruptions of the game with with this stuff. But that's why we work so hard the first series uh, for both teams on offense is to clean up that neutral zone. Clean it up. You've got to talk. If this is the first series. You've got to talk to these three wide outs and let them know, do not threaten the neutral zone. Don't do that tonight. Not gonna, not, I'm not going to be happy. Back up. Give me, give me room. I want to be able to see that tackle. That's really important to me. And if I've got a guy that's in the neutral zone and I can't see the tackle, I got two problems. I got a guy behind me. In the, I got a guy in the neutral zone and I got a tackle that's, you know, I can't see. So we have to clean it up early. So right. we don't have those problems later. So the thing I always tell coaches that diffuses us right away, if you're on offense, do you want me to call that? He's like, no. 
So, so real quick, there's a, a question that popped up or a, a, a thing from John Isham. He says he puts his leg on the line and you can't see me obviously, but I'll, if they come out, our receivers are always look at us and I'll tell them whether they're good every single time. Even mm -hmm. if they're in no man's land, I'd love to have them in a little better formation. Which you net which, when they come out, if you put your leg out and you say, "Hey, here's the line of scrimmage," you never tell them ever to move up or move back. No. Never tell them to move up or move back. You say, "Hey, here's the line of scrimmage." But the only time you do that is when you want them to move. If you tell a receiver to move, if there's a receiver in no man's land and they run the play, and you don't call it, nobody's going to care. But if you tell a receiver to move up and he takes a step up as a guy's going in motion, you have no choice now but to throw a foul because everyone on film is going to see two people moving at the same time. And that coach will go, hey, go. I mean, that player, when you throw the foul, because you should, will go over to his coach and say, he told me to move. Yeah. So you got to be really cautious how you do it. If they're in no man's land, the best thing to do is to tell them after the play and just have them fix it after the play. But be really cautious on how you tell people to move up or back. Yeah, and I'm not should... saying you don't do it. Like if Johnny a DB is lined up in the neutral zone and beyond it, I'll just say, hey, take a look. And he'll know right then that he's in the neutral zone and go back on there. Ishim, why don't you talk about pregame? What's that? John Ishim. Oh, I just, I, you know, when I'm watching the receivers in, in pregame and I'm getting my snaps with offense, you know, I just start there and remind them, hey, I'm going to give you my leg as the line all night. You know, take a look. I don't know whether you're on or off. That's That's not my call. But – um, I'm going to give it to you and then punch, you know, based off where he lines up. But if you start that conversation with these guys in the warmups, uh, they're not surprised, you know, in the first series that, you know, they're looking at you and you can avoid some of these, you know, no man's land. 100%. So, you, so you brought up a good point. Do you guys point back? Some do. Like if you have a receiver off, uh, do you point back? Or in this situation, would you point back and do something where you have two people off? Or what do you guys do mechanic-wise, if anything? So it, in our mechanics, we it, it's an option for, right? Recommendation is to point. So in this particular case, I would go up with the outside receiver back, and I'd have a point back saying I've got my outside one back. The inside one is should be obvious to the other official. But in our mechanic, it's an option for the crew to decide. And our recommendation is the crew needs to talk starting right, right now, right? Pre-game, every game, um, and, you know, throughout the week, just to make sure they're on the same page. So on this formation, the whitest guy is back. So we're going to have to go back. That way, the guy across from me, he's, he knows I got, a, I got a guy up. He's got his guy up. We're good. So the only caution I will give you, let's assume – that the third guy is at the top of the screen and he's back. And so the guy at the top is pointing back. The guy at the bottom is pointing back. The only thing I'll ever caution you on is if you're ever going to throw the flag for too many men in the backfield or whatever the foul is, take a look and make sure you see him. Don't ever do it based on a signal. You'll, you'll, you'll end up getting in trouble one day if you do it just based on a signal. If that If one person points back and the other one points back and now you got to look back, you should see five guys in the backfield before you throw your flag. If you don't, and it looks like one's close on the other side and you don't know whether he's on or off, you're probably better off just not throwing the flag. Yeah, so and Steve, I'll tell you the reason it came about is because one day an official across from me threw a flag. He came over and said, hey, you pointed back. He goes, I, I threw my flag for it. And when I sat there, I go, God, if I pointed back, he must have been back. But what would happen is the coach went to step in front of me and I put my hand out to stop him from stepping in front of me. And he interpreted it as being back. And so that's the only caution I'll warn you on. Okay, Steve, it's a good point. We do have a supplement or uh, a second signal if we do have too many back, right? At that point, the flank officials looking at each other should be start, they should start tapping their flag. So hey, I've got a confirmation okay. too. So I've got one back, you've got one back. I've got, you know, three others. I've got too many. I tap my flag, you tap your flag, and we know, both know we're going to go up. And if, if you think at the end of the play, you're going to walk over and now that official on the other side is going to remember which way he pointed your sadly mistake. Yeah. So make sure you don't think you're going to go over there and ask him, hey, I threw it because you pointed back. We're good, right? Because he's not going to know. Because yeah. Okay, we got about eight minutes left, so pick some good ones. All right, John, you're up. All right, well, here's the here's a play we've all seen. 
and it just sucks. You're like, holy crap, what just happened? So, you know, obviously, you know, when you're working five man, you know, we got a guy running in space over here. We're probably not going to have eyes down here. We're probably looking downfield. And all of a sudden you see a ball fluttering at you. You know, Scott, how would you want this one handled with your crew? Uh, <laughs> first thing, me as a white hat, I'm looking to my flank for help. I want to know if they have any opinion. If they have an opinion, they need to be coming in uh, and pointing if they have positive. As you said before, if they're sure of what it is, they need to point, right? The other, the off official from this is going away from them. They need to have an opinion on this as well. But Who's I'm going to make it. Are you going to make the call whether it's a fumble or a pass? Because yeah. that's the biggest issue in this. Yeah. Um, so, the, so, the, so, the, so the white hat makes a call whether it's a pass or fumble, right? We should maybe yes. be making that call. Right. 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 The, I should want to say with the white hat needs to make the call fumble or not, right? If we have a control and all those things that make it a pass. But we, we do need to see, we do need to understand what the initial direction was too, right? Correct. Slightly, slightly different high school. So that is the white hat's call fumble pass. Uh, and then initial direction, we need some help on it. Because if we have it, um, I've had this play, but instead of the player going low, the player goes at, at chest with his hand up. So the, the ball comes out funky because it was contacted, but it was in control, right? And if it goes backwards because it's in control, but goes backwards, we still, we have a fumble, right? So control or not, direction or not, I need some help from the flanks, but it's the white hat's call. So what I would do, and I'm sure John will do the same thing on this, we will let this play play out because mm -hmm. uh, we know uh, we know it's forward 100%. Uh, and we'll cover who covers forward, backward, pass, in a minute, but we know it's forward 100%, but we don't know if it's a pass fumble. So we're going to let this play out. And as soon as the play is done, the first thing we're going to do is go, hey, did you have a fumble on that or did you have a pass? And somebody made a comment just a second ago about looking for the beanbag. Um, sometimes you'll see a beanbag. Sometimes the referee might not remember it. But you got to let it play out. And then you got to come to the referee and say, hey, do you got this as a pass or a fumble? And if he says it's a pass, because a lot of times the referee will have to stay with the quarterback. He might not know what happens to it after this. He goes, I got it as a pass. Then you just step back and you wave it off and you're done and you move on. So let me ask, what's the what's the philosophy if you're not sure if it's a fumble or a pass? For the referee? Yep. Scott, what do you got? If I'm not sure, it's a, it's a, it's a pass. No cheap fumbles. Absolutely. If I'm not sure, it's a pass, and I'm going to – I'll be slow to kill it. If I'm sure, obviously, I'm going to kill it, right? Right. Uh, if I'm not sure, um, it's, I'm going to kill it slow. If I know that it's fumble, I'm backpedaling. That's just my first step. Right, because I have no idea what how it's going to be recovered at that point, right? Yeah, but I would right. just I, I would just say that if you if you're a flank and you know this is incomplete, don't don't let it play out. If um, if you know for a fact, but if the ball comes yeah. out funky, you got to be careful. But if you know for a fact that it's a pass and you was clear, you could clearly see it coming out of the hand as a pass, and you know it's not a fumble. I agree with you hundred percent. Shut it down because nothing looks worse than when it gets picked up and ran all the way back, and then we fix it. Right. So, but also nothing looks worse if it ends up being a fumble and we shut it down and they were going to run it back for a touchdown and we shut it down. So yeah, you got yeah I just, I look at the referee, if he's deer in the headlights and he has no idea, then I got to make the call right then. And, and we're either going to play it out or I'm going incomplete on this one, but. Yeah, but I'm, I'm telling you, John, you got to be careful because Brian Borton has had one of those in a D3 game where, um, uh, Linfield quarterback gets hit in the back and the ball is loose and knocked forward and it looked like a pass. You just don't know. You yeah. don't know. And he signaled incomplete pass from the back from deep secondary. And you gotta trust, you gotta trust that your uh referee make can make the call on this. You just got it. Now, if you let it play out and he has no clue after that. And then you think it's out and go, hey, maybe the better call, because we're in a situation, maybe the better call is to incomplete this and let's incomplete it and be done with it. But you got to trust your other officials. If you don't, go look at the Boise State, Oklahoma uh, State game a couple years ago when they shut one of these down. And it was in the fourth quarter and Boise State ran it all the way back for a touchdown and ended up losing by less than seven points because they didn't get the touchdown. So 
Yeah. And so I, my, my advice to Flanks is have an opinion, though. Don't correct. have nothing here, right? I mean, you're not correct. helping anybody if you don't have an opinion one way or the other, because you might be the only opinion. Correct. Yeah, and it's the other way, too. And John, I appreciate that. And that, that's, I'm hoping I'll get some help. But as, as a white, if, if I'm looking at my flanks, because I'm kind of looking like I'm not sure, and they have deer in the headlights, well, then it's on me. I got to make that call, right? Well, that was the reason why I put this play on here was yeah. to make sure we're, uh, you know, processing the play completely and, you know, knowing which pieces of this, you know, who owns, who owns whether this is a pass or a fumble, you know, it would be great if we get a piece of this, but I can tell you on this play, my eyes are probably downfield and I get back and I look and I'm, you know, now you're guessing. So don't put yourself in a position where you're, you're shutting us down and, it's not. It's not a pass. Greg, John, you have, Greg, you have your hand up. Yeah, Greg. I yeah, that. and I don't want to mess up the plays that we're going over. First of all, guys, great conversation tonight. But I would just want your thoughts on the left tackle from a play ago. Previous play. No, I don't think anyone talked about him being in the backfield, but at the high school level, that's something we're going to you know have coaches asking us about. And uh, in my opinion, that left tackle is uh, lined up in the backfield and he's he could be just past the 30 28 yard line and the ball's what 25 and a half so greg i'll give you my opinion on it it might be different than john's we have so many people all the time especially non-line of scrimmage guys that say hey you got to tell this guy to do this why don't you throw the flag and i never get downgrades i've had two downgrades probably in 17 years and until they start downgrading me this one right there, it's tight. And I'll tell you, I did a study last year because it bothered me that we had all these comments about this. And what you'll learn when I, when I did the study, what you'll learn is almost every single comment had to do with an angle going to the left in the video or an angle going to the right and the top guy off the screen. So this one's not bad because it's kind of straight, but it looks like they're farther off. My recommendation is very simple. If it's huge, warn them, warn them the first time. If it's if it's a tweener thing, or even if it's somewhat big, if it's gigantic, throw it, but don't ever throw them at a point in the game that matters. If you're at the end of the game in a tie ball game, I don't care if he's six inches off the center's waist. That's not how we're going to decide the outcome of this football game. If it's in the first quarter with 12 minutes, that's a whole different ball game. So just be very, very cautious throwing formation fouls. Work on getting them up. If they really don't do it, then get them. Because if you throw this, I can guarantee you without a shadow of a doubt, if we went and looked at Washington's tackles in this whole game, the coach can pull five of them out that look just like that. Almost can guarantee it. Yeah. So just be really, really cautious about it. I'm not saying don't do it, but just be cautious. And John might have a different opinion. No, I don't. I mean, we, we don't want to be too technical with these. Um, you know, especially when you're looking at this, yeah, the right and left tackle. What I always look for, do I have a piece of the helmet catching – the backside of the center, you know, that that's what I want. If I, if I don't, then I'm looking for something that's probably in the eight inches gap um, range before I think this is a foul, but then I'll also look at where's the end. And is this guy getting beat all day? Is he, is he cheating because he can't keep up with this end? You know, that's, you know, again, it's, it's, um, we always talk about advantage, disadvantage. You know, right now when I'm looking at this, I don't see really that much of an advantage being gained. You know, those 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 ends are rushing straight up. They're not they're not trying to beat them around the edge. You know, um, you know I know it's tough to evaluate sometimes, but I, I just want it blatant. A lot of times when the tackles are back, you'll have you know the guard completely exposed or the center completely exposed. Those are the ones you have to call. And, and my last comment on this comment, and then I think we're at 801, is if you're going to warn them, there's unofficial warnings and there's official warnings. You can go warm a tackle to get up, but if when you finally get to the official thing, you got to go to the head coach and tell the head coach, hey, I warned your tackles to get up. Then if you throw the next one, he already knows it's out there. And it's a lot easier and a lot less painful uh, of calling it. No, Hoover, I think we might be at our time. Real quick, we that's why I asked that question because it kind of sets the bar. We we got five minutes left in the first quarter. Um, if you have not talked to him by that point, then you know what? We've set the bar. We we can't be worried about you know that type of formation the rest of the game. Yeah. And well, you know, I you think, 
You got the O2O, just go ahead and, you know, O2O, the referee, the umpire, say, hey, get 55 up. Yeah. And if you do it three times in the game, who cares? Our our job is just to clean it up. Yeah. So you go to – I went to the assistant coach. I thought the offensive line coach would help me uh, move the kids up. That was wrong, wrong, wrong. When I went to the head coach, they moved right up. So – you know, make sure we're going through the head coach. It's nice to work with the assistant coach. It's great if he helps you out, but don't expect that he's going to help you out because he wants to make sure they're protecting. And then, and, and there's a reason he's cheating back. So um, we're going to warn and work hard at the beginning of the, each of the games. We're going to get the formations cleaned up, the line of scrimmage cleaned up. We're going to start in pregame, like John Isham talked about, where we're working with with players there and then then they play football and uh, unless it's egregious so i really appreciate this john steve thank you so much uh the film was great really well done um and uh, and, and very clear and uh, and really tough tough plays you guys picked some really challenging plays i want to watch this one okay <laughs> oh jeez. Yeah. Give us another look at it. So forward backward pass, it's my understanding in high school that the guy in the bottom of the screen is supposed to have this one. He's supposed to, yeah, he's supposed to have the best look at something, but this isn't the one that this play isn't the one we drew it up for. Um, this is a pretty short throw. This is pretty bad. Yeah, and he's all the way over, almost to the top of the numbers. But the line of scrimmage official, he doesn't have a good look at it either. He's downfield. Yeah. So I brought I brought this up only because just to talk philosophy about, um, you know, where we have passes in the backfield, whether we're whether forward or backwards. What's our philosophy for, <clears throat> you know, ruling on this? You know, that's probably backwards, but if we're not sure, and especially if it's coming to the short side, you're not going to have an angle on that to get that exactly right. I mean, they end up going incomplete here. Which, and PK, they try to, you know, come on, so. I think okay. that, you know, they did the best they could with this. Yeah, I'd be okay with incomplete. It's just so, the safest, easiest thing. Right. Yeah, I wish that flank had move back a little bit to get a little better angle but well for sure um we're at 805 thank you john i hope everybody enjoyed it um uh again we're gonna have the video of this uh, tape of this put up on our website um so you guys uh their view our website's viewed all over the nation so i'm sure 